I'll just wait a couple minutes and give everyone a chance. Yeah. Hello, my dear. I'm good. I was up there. I didn't know that I was pitching in on that. And then I saw you sitting down there holding up the sign. And I smiled and thought, that's good. She's keeping me on time. I'm glad. No, that was good. I'm glad it was, I'm glad it was you were there. <laughs> it is helpful. It's useful. Yeah, it is. It is. There's a few. <laughs> there, are, there are a few. There are a few, but well. I was just going to give everyone just a couple of minutes to get over here and then get started, if that's all right. We're all we're all okay with that. Just two more minutes, two or three minutes, and then we'll then we'll get going. Okay, perfect. All right, everybody. Well, let's let's go ahead and get started. We have um, we have a little bit of a, a switch because Suki, who's delightful, and any of you, I don't know if anyone who's been to Georgetown, but Dr. Subramanian couldn't get here. Um, there's a lot of problems with things being tied up on the East Coast right now. I think with all of the the smoke from the fires and everything else, and so she just wasn't able. To I am. I, I will speak up more. Um, my co-speaker, Dr. Subramanian, is not able to make it. She was stuck on the East Coast and couldn't get her flight across. And so I was fortunate, though, that um, one of my colleagues, Mark Berner Hansen, Mark um, works with Zealand, and he and I have been involved in the GLP-2 trials uh, right from the, from the design of the trials up to, up to implementation. And he's really intimately familiar with everything. So he'll pitch in um, in Suki's role going over her part of the talk. What I'm going to do is I, I will start out and I'll sort of provide you with a little bit of an introduction. And we're going to try to not make it a very high level, um, very technical talk, uh, something that is, is, is hopefully understandable to everyone in the room. Um, Mark will then present uh, some of the data, especially focused on some of the patient related outcomes and the quality of life stuff. We'll take a little bit of a break. But after we come back from the break, you know, we. We can talk a little bit about this if you want to, but after I did the, the session on central lines this morning, I realized I think sometimes people just want to talk about all kinds of different issues. So what I thought is if this whole thing takes us 45 minutes or something like that, and we'll still have an hour or so afterwards, why don't we just talk about whatever? 
and I'll just be here and we can just talk about anything at all that's short bowel syndrome related. It doesn't matter to me. It can be this stuff, but it can be more, st if you want to talk more about lines, if you want to talk about surgeries, you want to, anything, if, if, if it's anything that I can talk about, I'll talk about. And I can usually talk about anything if, if you, <laughs> so. So I'll tell you a little bit about, um, I'll introduce the, the concept of GLP-2s. Uh, it's something that's transformed the field, that's changed my life in a, in a lot of different ways, uh, even in the way, that, the way I think about treating patients now, the way I think about um, performing surgeries. So it, it's actually had a lot of impact on, on uh, in many more ways than I think was ever really intended initially. So let's get into it. Um, I have just a, a few different disclosures. I'm working with most, most everyone who's working in the GLP-2 field. So, you know, I, that's, you know, they just have a variety of different kinds of supports for that. This is what I just talked about, um, that I'll do a little introduction. Um, Mark will pitch in for Suki and do the, sort of the, the bulk of the, the, the data coming from glutaglutide. And then we'll really just have an open discussion afterwards about anything that you want to talk about. And it can be this or, or anything else, really. So. All right, so some very, very simple stuff because, you know, obviously I didn't know where everyone was at, but, you know, sometimes as, as doctors, we say, like surgeons will interchangeably say intestine and bowel and stuff back and forth. And I must be honest, for the first six months of medical school, I didn't necessarily appreciate that they were always talking about the same thing when you say small bowel or small intestine or large bowel, large intestine or colon because, you, you know, you're not necessarily sure. So. So your small intestine, remember that's kind of like if you stuck your hand right there and went forward, that would be the blood vessel going out to your small intestine, then your intestine would be dangling off of your fingers like that. And if you have all of your small intestine as an adult, you probably have something like 15 to 25 feet of intestine. It's a little bit variable person to person. Babies generally are born with about six feet of intestine-ish. So we get a lot of growth of our small intestine in the third trimester when you're in utero. It kind of doubles in length, um, which is why sometimes if you have, if, if some of you are caregivers of little children and, you know, if your baby was born at 27 weeks and they say, oh, gee, you were born and you had 15 centimeters of small intestine. Well, I know that that child's going to spend most of their third trimester outside of the, outside of the uterus. And so they're going to get a doubling by the time they get to sort of age zero. Then they're going to double again by the time they get to be about two years of age. Then they're going to double again by the time they get to be about 12 years of age. And then we don't really gain length too much more after that. And our small intestine, remember that does like, it absorbs our nutrition, helps us to, it does a pile of things. But for our purposes today, it absorbs our, you know, our, um, our food, our digested food, water and electrolytes. And it produces different kinds of hormones and has different interactions with our body. And then our large intestine, which is also large bowel or colon, all the same thing, just in case I use different terms, sort of sits around the outside like a picture frame. And it works mostly absorbing fluids and electrolytes, but it actually can do quite a bit of calorie absorption at times. And so that's really important to us in um, little kids and adults with short bowel because we, we count on driving some calorie absorption in your colon in a way that it's not necessarily intended to. So we'll actually feed sometimes to not feed your bodies, but to feed the bacteria inside your colon, because those bacteria will make different kinds of short chain fatty acids that can be absorbed by your colon. And so we kind of take advantage of that. And it also has a really, really important thing that I give whole lectures on, which is the gut microbiome, all those microbes that are super important to your body that affect everything. And, and that could be something people might want to talk about later. I can do like a you know, a two hour talk on the gut microbiome and how that affects you. But, but if you had some questions later, we can totally talk about that. Okay, so some of the stuff that Mark might talk about or that you might hear about, intestinal failure. So when we talk about intestinal failure, what we mean is if you can't maintain your own sort of um, state of nutrition or hydration with your own intestines alone, then anything other than that is intestinal failure. So um, if you have to get, basically, if you have to get intravenous anything, that kind of is intestinal failure. And that could range from, I have to have seven days of TPN and I get four and a half liters a day, to I need IV fluids two days a week and I get a liter each time. But if I don't get my one liter two days a week, then I eventually get dehydrated and I feel poorly. So anything that falls within that is kind of intestinal failure. So anything that needs an intravenous support. Now, if you're on tube feeds, and, but you're, and, and that's all you need and you don't need anything intravenous, then that's technically not intestinal failure because we call that, the, the fancy term we use is enteral independence, 
meaning you're, you're independent and using your gut alone. And that's one of the things in intestinal rehabilitation that we're always shooting for right away is to try to, that idea of can we get off of TPN and can we achieve enteral independence. So now there's something that's closely related but not exactly related, and this could come up today, and this is the idea of intestinal insufficiency, which means, remember what I said was failure has a very specific diagnosis. If you don't have that, but if, if you can manage using your own intestines, but what you have to do to manage is really difficult for you, then that's this idea of intestinal insufficiency of II. Meaning, you know, maybe, um, maybe you can maintain your weight, but just barely, right? Like you're skinnier than, you know, you skinnier than you want to be. And not just like a little bit skinny, but just like, you know, if you get any illness at all, you, you know, you lose 10 pounds and it takes you four months to get them back again or something like that. Um, if you have a burdensome focus on eating and drinking. So sometimes what do we forget as doctors? Like we, we say, oh yeah, it's just, it's really important to eat six small meals a day and to drink your electrolyte drinks and blah, 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 and do all this stuff. And then you start, especially if you're doing it for a little kid who doesn't really want to eat in the first place or something, we have to be cognizant of not giving you eight hours worth of eating work a day because you, can, you can't do anything else, right? If, if you're spending your whole life saying, gee, every two hours I have to sit down and this guy says, Mercer says I have to eat 400 calories six times a day. And, um, you know, how am I going to do that? You know, how am I going to prepare the food? When am I going to find the time? I've got to get kids to soccer. I've got to go to work. I have to do whatever, you know. It, so, so sometimes it can be really hard and just burdensome. So, yeah, you're off of TPN, but it's really hard to stay off of TPN, right? So that can be II. And then the other thing can just be, you know, maybe you can do it. Maybe you can actually get those calories in. You can get the tube feeds into your kid or everything else. But, but now you're pooping 14 times a day, right? Which makes it kind of hard to go to the grocery store. It's kind of hard to go out for dinner without having to leave the table three times, you know, during a meal and stuff like that. So these are all things that, that can be really, really impactful on your life. So even though you don't technically have intestinal failure, you wouldn't qualify to be in a GLP-2 trial or something, but it's still really, really impactful on your life. So there are terms that come up in discussion. Short bowel syndrome. When we're talking about these drugs, we're really talking about them in the context of short bowel, right? So you can have intestinal failure and have all of your intestine, but maybe it just doesn't work very well. And that sometimes, um, you, you, through all of your community, you will have met many different patients who have a lot of intestine. They haven't lost it, but it's not functioning. Maybe there's too much pain to eat anything, too much vomiting, or for a variety of different reasons, it's not absorbing well. That's not really what we're going to talk about today, though, in these trials. Here we're talking about where you've just physically lost, um, you've lost length of intestine. So you, you don't have, we call it absorptive surface. So you've just lost that surface to absorb calories in. Generally in adults, we sort of say this is if you have under 200 centimeters of bowel. Um, and that's the definition we use in most of the trials. The reality is it's a moving target because we're better and better at it as time has passed. And so you don't necessarily want to hang your hat on any certain length. You don't say, if I have this, I will be awesome. If I'm below this, I'm going to be crappy. It's kind of a moving target because we're getting better at it. And in children, it's not the same. In children, we work kind of off of percentage of expected length. So, and, and even there, we don't know exactly what the right answer is, but we might say, gee, it's short bowel if it's less than 20% of expected length or maybe less than 40%, or it's kind of variable as to what that number is. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna teach you just a teeny little bit about GLP-2, because Mark's gonna get a little bit more into what, what the, the actual drug trial stuff. So we have these little cells called L cells that make different kinds of hormones in, in, in our body. And two of the things that can be important are GLP-1 and GLP-2. GLP-1 is really pop, it's really trendy right now in the news, because that's like Ozempic and everything, right? Which everybody hears 10 times a day all the time. So GLP-1, fundamentally what that, we won't get into that, but what it does is it, if you take it, it kind of makes you feel gross. It makes you not want to eat, and so you don't eat and you lose weight. Um, now, interestingly enough, if you actually give it to a short bowel patient, it doesn't necessarily do the same thing. In, in fact, it can almost have a paradoxical effect in short bowel people. Much of the GLP-1 and the GLP-2 that we make, we make from towards the end of our small intestine and in the first part of our large intestine. 
And so that, those are common things to have lost. It's very common in children for all the different ways that kids lose bowel. They tend to lose that part of the bowel. And it's also not an uncommon thing in patients with Crohn's disease and stuff like that. So you often lose the part of your bowel that makes your GLP-1 and your GLP-2. So you're sort of like GLP-2 deficient or GLP-1 deficient. So then sometimes when we give you something that your body needs, it responds differently to it from if we just give it to somebody in the general population who already makes their all, all the GLP-1 they need. We give them Ozempic and it makes them feel gross. If we, so then, then because they feel gross, they don't eat and then they lose weight. Whereas if we take someone who doesn't have that and we give it to them, it sometimes seems to have a different effect and it can actually have a stimulatory effect and make you want to eat more. Because gosh, if we were treating, imagine if we were treating short bowel patients with something that made them not want to eat food, that would make it really, really hard for us to, to try to get off of TPN. Okay, so how does this stuff work? Basically, it, the, the way the body, it, it makes it, and the actual little molecule doesn't last for very long. It only lasts for a few minutes, the natural molecule. So the idea is it gets made close to where it's supposed to act. We call that, the fancy term in medicine is paracrine. So it works, and it works just in the area right around where it's supposed to work, and then it just breaks down and disappears. So if you eat a meal, what happens is, oh, heck, that was, uh, there's forward. If you eat a meal, you get little spikes. So there's someone who eats breakfast and it spikes up and then it kind of does whatever till lunchtime, then it spikes up. Then they eat an evening meal and it spikes. It's going up and down throughout the day. Now it does a lot of different things. Um, so GLP-2, this is the stuff we just talked about, but if you give it, 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 it can decrease your desire to eat. Now again, though, as I told you, if you have short bowel, it can be paradoxical. And in fact, many patients who go on GLP-2s feel within days before it has any effect on their intestines, like before it would really make sense that it can cause anything to change, they actually feel better. And so, uh, you know, I have, I can think of like teenage girls from the pediatric trials who would say like within two days, it's like, you know, it's like getting a shot of espresso or something. They just felt like they had more energy. So it seems like it's giving your body back something that it wants. Um, it changes, uh, sort of changes, it can change around in your pancreas, the way you make some of the different things that control glucose in your body. It's not too relevant today. It can cut down on resorption of bone, which may be important, right? If uh, one of the things that we always harp on you guys is, you know, making sure we have good bone health, you know, making sure you take those big giant doses of vitamin D that we pound into you all the time and tell you to get out and get in the sun and take your calcium and, you know, everyone harps on you all the time. Well, maybe it will have a positive effect on cutting down on how much bone you lose. So that would be good. But let's focus a little bit more on the GI tract stuff. Okay, so, and I'll try to explain a little bit of, of what I mean by each one of these things without getting into too much boring detail. But, so what's one of the things it does? Well, it, it, it increases something called Crypt's, Crypt cell proliferation. I don't need my chair. I can just sit on the floor or something here. I'll, I'll put that there and there's one up here. Come sit, come sit, no, please. Let's get everybody settled. And we can, and honestly, we can run and get more chairs too. It's no problem. <laughs> no, I don't know. So, so what, so I'm going to explain all this to you. So, so this is a villus. So remember inside your intestines, you have your, you know, your intestine and microscopically have all these little villi, these little fingers, right? And, that, and that's your absorptive surface. So remember how people say like, if you took your intestines and you stretched them out flat, they would be the size of a tennis court and that sort of thing. So that's the idea that there's so many little ups and downs in it that the surface area is really, really big relative to the size of the intestine. So what, is, what, is this, what does this stuff do? Well, down at the bottom of these villi are the things called crypts. And there's little cells at the bottom. That's kind of like where the stem cells come from at the bottom. And then the cells multiply down here and they, and they get pushed up here and they travel up, 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 up to the tip of the villus. So one of the things that GLP-2 does is it increases crypt cell proliferation. So you're shooting more cells in at the bottom. Then it reduces something called apoptosis, which is like programmed cell death. So it, it makes more cells come from the bottom, but then it slows down how quickly they die at the top. So in the end then, what you're doing is you're putting more cells into the system, not getting rid of them so quickly. So there's more of them. And the villi get longer and everything kind of elongates. So that's good, right? Because we have more absorptive. Every one of those cells helps us to absorb that much better. So the more cells we can have sitting there, the better we do. It increases blood flow. So that's important because remember, blood has to then flow past this. So the food has to come through here 
get picked up in these blood vessels and flow to our liver and get processed and then go through our body. And that's how we actually turn food into muscles and bones and stuff. So increasing portal blood flow is probably a good thing. Um, the, you know, the, the, there, there are, in some very technical ways, it could be more challenging at times too, but, but we sort of take advantage of it. I think it's, it's more good than not good. It improves nutrient absorption. It probably has a little bit of a slowing down effect on the intestine, which is good if you have short bowel, right? Because we're always trying to think of what can we do to make stuff stay in there for just a couple minutes longer. That idea of transit time, like how fast does it take from, you know, top to bottom. If we can slow transit time down a little bit, then that's advantageous. It's that much more time that we can absorb stuff. In some non-specific ways, it might make things less inflamed, so that's got to be good, I would think. Um, cuts down in gastric acid secretion, so just like we're, you know, we're always putting people on protonics and you know, people, you know, put H2 blockers inside your TPN and stuff, sort of to cut down on how much acid you're secreting, which is a double-edged sword and something we can talk about in the second hour for sure, because I'm kind of a little bit pro having acid when, when you're able to, but, but we can talk about it. And, and it probably does something to, to change gut permeability, which is like the, sort of the leakiness between the cells and how easy it is for stuff to leak into your bloodstream and to leak back out into the lumen of your bowel. So in the end, if you look at this conceptually, and I'm wrapping up in just a couple more slides, if you have short bowel, you have a bunch of stuff coming out, you don't absorb really, really well. It's harder for you to absorb nutrients and fluid, so you're sort of tipped, your, your balance is tipped this way. And we know what you want, you ideally most people I think want the least amount of parenteral support that they have to have to feel better during the day and have more energy, to poop less, um, to have less problems with dehydration. So if those are what your goals are, then if we can do a GLP-2 that increases up those circles and makes you absorb more fluid and more nutrients, maybe we can get a little better balance so that you're not really a net loser of, of uh, you know, net loser of secretions. It might just be better for you in the long run. So the, there's one GLP-2 analog that's approved right now, and that's, that's Tadouglutide, or Gatex in North America and Revestive, I think, in Europe. It was approved for adults in 2012, approved for pediatrics in 2019. So we've had these drugs for quite a while now. I mean, we've been using them in adults for over a decade, so I think we're getting pretty confident with that. And honestly, even in the kiddos, I mean, it's four years now. We've got, in Nebraska, we have 36 or 37 kids on, on drug. And so we you know, start to get reasonably comfortable with using it. Now, what we have is kind of what's coming, what we're going to talk about a little bit today are the extended action analogs, the longer lasting, sort of like version 2.0. So we've completed the phase two trials on glopaglutide, and that comes from Zealand, and that's what Mark will talk about. And there's another ongoing trial right now with a drug called apraglutide. And so that, that's the, the phase one trial is just ongoing right now, so we just don't have the results yet. So I'll tell you just a little bit about tadouglutide because it's important to, to see this because it'll help you to just yeah, make some sense of what you're going to see with the data. So when the original adult trials um, happened and we reported back in 2012, that what you see, this is like how much your TPN got reduced over the course of the week. And the black bars are the people that were on the drug. And so you can see you get on the drug and you're, um, you know, at four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, 16 weeks, you know, you, the, there's a reduction in the amount of parenteral volume per day. Now the white bars are placebo. So one of the things that's important about this isn't, it, this part's important, but this part is also important, the placebo part, because you would say, well, if they just got placebo, how come they got better? And this is a real pain in the ass for us trying to do trials, because <laughs> honestly, it's, 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 a p it's literally a pain in the ass, because we try to get rid of it, right? What you want to have is no placebo effect. You want that to be straight, because then this curve looks like that, we, that's a big change, and you go, wow, look at the difference. That's statistically significant. The FDA goes, we should approve your drug. <laughs> but when this happens, then we all go, God, the hell's going on? Like, why do they all, because we all think we're awesome, right? We all think, oh, we're managing every patient perfectly. Then you put them in a trial, and they do better. And it's probably because then we start to pay attention more. Now, I'd like to think in Nebraska, we're pretty anal about paying attention. But I don't know what my placebo effect is going to be on the GLEPA trial, and I can't wait to see, because I'd like to think we don't have any, because I feel like we're really on top of things, but maybe we do. And if we do, then I want to find out why. But this might be because when you're in a trial, everyone watches how much do you drink, how much do you eat, you pay attention to it, you record it, you think about it all the time. And so it may be that just doing that is enough to actually get you off of some TPN. Right, everyone goes, oh, I need this much fluid. I, I, I have to have three liters of fluid a day. 
But then when we actually measure your pee and we go, well, you know, you peed 2,200 milliliters and you really only need to pee 1,200 milliliters so we can probably cut your fluid back. And then people start to realize that, gee, the way I feel on my IV fluids isn't necessarily the same as being dehydrated. Like if I took everyone with normal bowel and gave you all two liters of normal saline, everyone feels better. Right, you just you get a little jazzed. You feel better. I mean, if you're in Vegas and you're hungover, they give you two liters of fluid, <laughs> you're golden. You know, you feel good. So two liters of fluid makes the world feel better. Sometimes we misinterpret that better feeling as, oh, I was dehydrated and now I'm hydrated again. But it's not necessarily the case. Sometimes that up feeling isn't just a, a simply a product of dehydration. And so anyway, that's where that placebo effect comes from. So that's something that we seem to see in all the trials. We're doing our best to try to get rid of it, but, but it's kind of a pain in the ass to get rid of. This is the pediatric data. Same sort of lines for the drug. We didn't really do placebo in this trial. We just did something called standard of care where we just observed one cohort of kids. So it's not really apples to oranges, but even that, even just observing, right, where we didn't even do the things, we still saw a teeny bit of improvement, although it's not really that much, and it kind of is pretty close to the baseline. So. But anyway, that's kind of the way those curves look. And with that, there's my little thing that says we'll march off into the future. And Mark, would you take over and start to talk about the next bit of stuff? Okay, so thank you for that, Dean. You're welcome. So uh, hello, everybody. I'm not Dr. Supermanian. I'm <laughs> Dr. Mark Bernard Hansen. So that's the first disclosure. <laughs> But I'm really happy and honored to be able to share with you uh, our data uh, on our flupaclotide, our long-acting CoP2 analog. And um, at the same time, I will also try to educate maybe a little bit and teach you a little bit both on how a drug development process impacts patients and trials and outcomes and maybe I'll also share with you a little bit the data in with respect to some new perspectives which we believe we have in this trial. So let's uh, start off with the, um, the title of the uh, presentation. That's Impact of Flupaclotide uh, on Clinical and Patient Reported Outcomes in Patients with Short Bowel Syndrome and Chronic Intestinal Failure. And these are results of what we call a phase three trial. And guys. as you know, we do I have early trials in humans and so we have late trials in humans. When there are late trials in humans, they are very important because they are the ones which the authorities will evaluate for whether they believe that this drug or this new medicine is meaningful, clinical meaningful and safe for patients. So this is what we call a phase three, a pivotal registrational trial. So on behalf of these co-investigators, and I'm one of them, uh, and Sealand Pharma as the sponsor and other investigators, I'm really happy to share the following data. Uh, I would like to go through the presentation and then we'll take questions after, if that's okay with the chairman here. Fair enough, Mark. Thank you. These are the dis disclosures of Sufi. My disclosures are that I'm an employee of Sealand Pharma and I'm a part-time clinical and research consultant at the University Hospital of Copenhagen, Denmark, and I'm a GI surgeon by training, but I have the same kind of profile as David. I'm very much into also medical therapy on top of surgery, so I'm like a hybrid <laughs> in many ways. <laughs> so I will be repeating a little bit what actually Dave already uh, pointed to, one being the definition of SBS, short bowel syndrome. You have the two types, the ones which you, where you need weekly parental support and those where, which do not need parental support to maintain health and growth for children weekly. That's intestinal insufficiency. Intestinal failure, intestinal insufficiency. In this study, this trial, it's the intestinal uh, failure patients we are focusing on, those who are sevi most severely burdened uh, by uh, the disease. David walked us very nicely through what are the uh, mode of actions of COP2, glucagon-like peptide 2. This is summarized here. So what COP2 does, it's a postprandial hormone. It is released after a meal. So you think of what 
uh, the body does after meals, that is what GLP-2 does, okay? It slows down if all the motility. It is full. It does not need more food. Slow down, that's what it's telling the body. So emptying of the stomach, emptying of the small intestine, etc., slows down. That's GLP-2. It also reduces all the secretions, all the fluid production from the stomach and the small intestine reduces this as well. It also, uh, what it also do, does is that it increases the blood flow to the intestine because you have a lot of food. You need to process it, carry it away from the intestine to the liver and systemically, as uh, Dave also pointed to. It is very, a very strong process factor. So what it does, as Dave also pointed to, is that it stimulates the proliferation, we call it hyperplasia, of the mucosa, the epithelial lining of the uh, in small intestine mainly, but actually also in the colon, the large intestine, not so much in the stomach. That is more uh, uh, like a secondary phenomenon if you see any any change in the epithelia in the, uh, in the stomach. Then what is also really interesting is that you know that the epithelia, the mucosa of the intestine, they, the cells are you know, together, tight together. If you have some kind of disease with inflammation, and actually also in SPS patients, the tightness is opened up a little bit, which opens up for more translation uh, and translocation, not only of fluids and, and good stuff, but also bacteria, potentially harmful as well. So you would like to tighten this a little bit more so you don't have the risk of translocation of microbiome the bad guys of the macro microbiome into the uh, systemic circulation. So that's also a good thing. It improves the signaling between the intestine and the extraintestinal organs, that being the kidney, it, be, it, be, it being the liver, actually all the way also to the brain, and also, as mentioned, the bones, uh, and actually also the, the pancreas at the end of the day. And then what we're all looking for here in, in patients with intestinal failure is improved absorption absorption of fluids and micronutrients and macronutrients. A lot of good stuff, right? So I hope you're stimulated and understand it is worthwhile exploring the use of GLP-2 in conditions where you actually are lacking GLP-2. Mm -hmm. SBS patients are lacking GLP-2. They don't have enough remaining small intestine with the cells producing and releasing GLP-2. Therefore, we need to replace, it's a re replacement therapy we're doing with the GLP-2 therapy uh, drug. Okay, so what is glipacrotide? It's a relative new kid on the block. It's been around for a while, years, but it takes a while getting it through the first phase one trial, phase two, and now we are at the end of phase three. It takes time. So as you can see here from the right, or the left from your side, uh, what is important is that we have the endogenous, the natural human uh, GLP-2 here, down here. As you can see, it's a, it's a peptide, 33 amino acids. It's composed of 33 amino acids. Broken down very fast in, by the enzyme systemically. So what do you do? You would like to have a drug or a medicine which is not broken down by the body. So you have a longer effect, a more long-acting, long, longer sustained effect of your medicine. That's what you're looking for. So what you do is that when you design uh, uh, new uh, medicines, and this goes for glipacrotide as well, is that you substitute, you replace some of the natural amino acids with another one. You're, 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 you're trying to cheat a little bit with the body so it doesn't recognize it as fast, okay? So that's what we did with nine amino acids we mm -hmm. substituted. And then at the end, we, we added, um, at the C terminal of the peptide, we added uh, six more amino acids. And by adding this, we call it the zip tail. It's important. By adding this, you actually induce stability, and you also make it more soluble, so you can actually have it in a liquid solution ready directly for infusion, injection. You don't have to have it in the powder and water and dissolve. It is ready to go and stable as such. We think this is a good idea. What is also important is 
that when the clopaclitide is metabolized following the subcutaneous injection, there's a, de a depot there. It is metabolized locally in the skin into what we call M2 and M1 and M2 metabolites. And this is important because it's not the parent compound, but it's the metabolites which are the biological acting uh, compound. This is really important, okay? So the metabolites are the ones you need to assess the effect of at the end of the day. And that goes for not only how long are they in the blood circulating, as you can see, the parent compound is very fast out of the body, but the metabolites are longer there. And that is actually the reason why we have a long-acting GLP-2 uh, analog in clopaclitide with an estimated half-life of 88 hours, okay? And that is due mainly, as you can see, on the, the second metabolite. Okay, it's a long-acting metabolite or GLP-2 analog. I think you, you get that now. But is, is it as effective as uh, endogenous normal GLP-2? What we do I I in, in drug development is that you use a cell, um, you, s you use some cells in vitro assay where you measure the effect on a certain marker. It's cyclic AMG, this is very technical. But what you do is that you have endogenous normal GLP-2 and then you see how much, you know, is it, is it as potent, as strong, as natural uh, hormone or not? And that's what we are showing here. This is the black one is not normal. And then you assess this. You see the, the, the blue one is the uh, parent. And then you see actually the M2 is the one which is very close to endogenous. So oh, we are happy. It's doing what it's supposed to in vitro, in cell culture. We'll see if it also works in humans and in vivo. And that's what we're showing with our phase three data, with, with trial you'll see in a moment. So now you know that it has a long half-life. It is potent and the half-life, estimated half-life is about 88 hours. So here we go to the trial. It's called EASE trial, efficacy and safety evaluation of clopaclitide in FDS patients. It is one out of several trials. This is the first phase three trial, the pivotal trial, the really important trial for assessing the efficacy and safety and tolerability of clopaclitide in patients, FDS patients with intestinal failure. There's always an objective, and there's some aims, and there's some goals, and endpoints. We need to go through these. But I think it is interesting for you also because we need to discuss at the end of the day, are these relevant endpoints for you as patients, caregivers, on top of us as clinicians, we believe they are, and the regulatory authorities believe that these are the key endpoints we need to assess. Maybe we're missing something in all this. We can have a discussion on that later. Primary objective to confirm the efficacy of clopaclitide in reducing parental support uh, volume in patients with SBS. The secondary objective to evaluate the efficacy on other endpoints, efficacy endpoints with this in the same patients, and importantly, to assess safety uh, and tolerability in the patients. It doesn't matter if, if, if it's effective if it kills people, right? Because <laughs> it could be a problem. <laughs> so the balance needs to be there, and it's really important <laughs> assessing safety and tolerability. This is the design. So the patients who, which goes into this trial needs to be very well characterized, and the reason for that is that if you, there's so much heterogeneity, you know this among just patients being here in the room and those you know, they're very different. They have different uh, issues and at different stages, and if you, put all the patients in one trial, it's going to be all over the place. They need to have some kind of similarity, some heterogeneity to be able to assess whether there's some impact, a change over time or not. If you, take it, you bring in everybody, you would need a huge number of patients. You would have to include all the patients maybe in US over a 10 year period. And nobody wants to wait for this, right? So what you do is that you identify those patients who have a significant unmet medical need, and then you identify the endpoints and the goals for improvement of therapy. This is what we did in this trial. So patients with intestinal failure, SPS, requiring three days or more per week of parental support. Moderate to severely burdened, in our opinion. This, this, that's what it are, they are. What they do before they get 
uh, into the active or the placebo arm is that you need to optimize patients. It takes time, okay? You, bel you think you are optimized when you walk in that door the first time, you're not. A lot of them are not. You'll realize that. Then you need to be stable because you can't go like this if you want to assess an endpoint. You need to be like this, right? And then you go down to this. And that, then you can say, okay, there's something going on. You're improving or you're worsening or you're the same, basically. Okay, after these optimization and stabilization uh, periods, then they're randomized into two active arms, either clopaxotide 10 milligrams twice weekly or 10 milligrams once weekly or the placebo, as David was, was mentioning. And they are randomized one to one to one. Mm -hmm. So you have one third chance picking one of the three arms when uh, you are randomized into this trial here. After the 24 weeks, they go into what we call extension trials. So they go into trials which have no placebo arm. They go into active arms. But those data will come later in 24. Inclusion and exclusion criteria are important. As I mentioned, which patients are in there? And this is really important. And as, as patients, if you're a patient here in the room here, and you're thinking, I would love to go into this trial, yeah, this is the, what you need to look for up front right now. Inclusion, exclusion criteria, that is going to help you not approach and, and, and have some hopes which you'll never meet, will never be met, okay? Look at those inclusion, exclusion criteria. So as you can see here, they need to be the, with the 200 or less centimeters of remaining uh, functioning short bowel. Uh, they need to have these three days or more uh, of PS, willing, of course, to go through the whole trial and adjust PS based on an algorithm where the uh, physician, the investigator, has a guideline to how to, to reduce or actually increase the PS based on certain criteria as urine outcome output, etc. And then you, you should be an adult below 90. I think that's fair. <laughs> Patients who are not eligible for this trial are those who have cancers. Remember, it's a trophic factor. So we don't want to risk that we induce or worsen a uh, patient's background cancer disease or potential increased risk for cancer. So those will not uh, be allowed to go into the trial. Uh, also, patients with severe cardiac disease, severe kidney disease, severe, severe, severe extra-intestinal uh, disease are not allowed to go here because they are at much higher risk for being admitted to hospital, et cetera, and having complications, which w uh, is going to complicate the interpretation of the data moving forward. Okay. Primary endpoint, what are we primarily looking for? And that is what the, p the, the uh, trial is powered toward. So that is what... The, it determines how many patients goes into the trial in the arms on an assumption to show a, sp a specific change over time. Placebo versus active arms. So this is the primary endpoint, the change in parental support per volume per week. Does it go down from 15 to 10 liters per week, 10 liters to 9? That's how we want to assess over the 24 weeks. Key secondary endpoints, efficacy endpoints. 20% reduction in PS, that's one. One day or more off PS is a second um, key en secondary endpoint. How does it look after 12 weeks, not 24 weeks? That was the first, the primary endpoint. And then the goal, total uh, enteral autonomy, complete weaning off. Out with that catheter, eat and get rid of the PS, wonderful endpoint, right? So everybody's looking for this, right? Uh, and that would be wonderful to achieve then. And then again, as I mentioned, and we did put this in bold, safety. It needs to be safe, end of story, uh, to, to justify moving forward. Okay, then there's a lot of endpoints in these kind of trials, and I don't want to go through all of them. What I want to focus on here uh, and, and share with you, and this is what is, is also uh, adding to the field, I believe, uh, for uh, GLP-2 uh, research is uh, the uh, assessment of how the patient feels and functions using these tools, the quality of life tools and the PRO tools. And as you can see here, we will be here at this meeting here, we'll be reporting what we call the SDSI, the SDS impact data we measured uh, in this trial. 
we also have uh, some PRO tools. It's called the PDIC uh, data. They will be disclosed at CERTA next week. I will not be able to discuss this at this meeting, so please do not ask, ask, ask me lots of questions. Okay. So here we go. Uh, what is the uh, SBS impact scale? So it was assessed or used in this trial to assess the symptoms and the impact of SBS on your everyday life at baseline and at week 24. Does it make any change in your life and how you perceive and feel and function? And these are the questions. How affected have you been uh, by GI symptoms related to SBS, you know, diarrhea, nausea, and the usual? How affected pain, muscles, bones, etc.? How have you uh, been affected uh, with pain related to your abdomen? You know, how exhausted or tired have you been? How uh, has the uh, illness affected your sleep over the last week? To what degree has the illness uh, interfered with things that you wanted to do the last week? And how much uh, has your illness affected your mood? How affected have uh, you been by stress and anxiety? These questions and these topics are not taking out of the blue. This is based on what is called the SBS uh, quality of life and further assessment of these, how they responded in other studies. So this is not our invention, this study invention, it is a didactic uh, outcome of previous work where we have uh, focused on these and that's why we call it the SBS impact, okay? So data, let's have a look of the, uh, on the patients who were actually in the trial. So. What we see here is that 145, uh, uh, 54 uh, patients were actually screened, meaning that the, the, the physician, the investigator thought, here we got a good patient, we're ready for the trial. But at the end of the day, only 106 of these were actually qualified per cri uh, inclusion, exclusion criteria, et cetera, et cetera. Remember all those things which were pushing patients out? Yeah, so at the end of the day, they didn't stabilize, they were not optimized. Well, all these things, right? But at the end of the day, 106. So this was the number who were randomized into the trial. Please note that 102 out of 106 completed the 24 weeks. That's six. That's 96 percent completing a 20, 24 week uh, uh, trial. And these are burdens, you know, burden patients uh, and subjects in a trial. So I think this indicates that at least it should be safe and well tolerated. That's why was when I saw these first data, I was really happy because then we're, it's got to do something which is at least not harmful because then the patient would have left the trial, right? So that was a good, that was a good first uh, finding. Um, so what about uh, the age uh, and the sex? So we were, ha we were happy and lucky because what you need to, you need to also uh, understand is that you need to have a good balance among the three arms in a trial. If they're very different in one arm, if they're all the old are there and all the young are in the other, you can't compare apples and pears, right? So we were lucky here, almost the same age across the group, in the three uh, arms, right? Around 55 of years of age, that was the mean age. 50-50, man, woman, gender, balance. And uh, the majority of patients were uh, less than 65 years of age, very few above. Hopefully that also reflects what is uh, common uh, clinical practice for this kind of patient. I think so. If it all had all been 18, 20 years or very old, uh, then you get into the situation, can you conclude, can you extrapolate into a more broader population? I think this represents what we see out in clinical practice. What is also important is the phenotype. You know that those with a stoma, a small intestinal stoma, they are different as compared to those who have the colon connected, the large intestine connected. They will respond differently, both with a volume difference, but also over time. Okay, so it's important that you also have a balance between those. And again, we were lucky. There was a, they, the three groups were nicely balanced. And as you can see, around 50% in all groups were with a stoma, and around 50% were without a stoma, with everything connected. And what is also important is that the underlying disease was almost the same also across the group. So the, ma the main etiology background disease 
with inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, which was followed by vascular disease in the st stomach mainly. Then you have surgical complications. If the small intestine turns around uh, uh, you know, within itself, it's called volvulus. And you also have the trauma patients. And I think this also represents, if you compare it to other trials previously and to clinical uh, practice, this is what is we, we see out there in the clinic. So again, it's reflecting what we believe looks like uh, the, uh, the uh, population uh, we are dealing with and have this unmet medical need. Okay, so what about the other baseline characteristics? So the mean PS need at baseline was around 13 to 15 liters per week. That's in the high end, moderate to severely uh, disease, right? We try to split them into those with more than 12 or less than 12 liters per week, because they, uh, they, they differ a little bit in response. We would anticipate those with higher amounts will respond more to a, an intervention than those who have lesser uh, PS needs, of course. I, can, uh, I think you can get why that is. Then uh, the uh, number of days uh, on PS is around six across all the uh, groups again. The weight uh, is, uh, and the BMI is normal, and actually some of them were in the high, higher end. They were overweighted. None of them had a, 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 a BMI indicated that they were mal malnourished or anything like that. So I think they were well treated when they entered the study, and they were also well treated when they exited the study. Okay, we talked about this, uh, and I think this is important to look at also at the extra intestinal organ function, because it's not only the intestine you want to fix, you want to fix all the other organs, right? They, they have been, they have been uh, impaired metabolically, so you also need to improve uh, their condition. And the patients who, who entered this trial, one out of three had some kind of liver impairment, we call it mild to moderate liver impairment. They had elevated liver enzyme function tests, so they were mild to moderately impaired. Two out of three were kidney impaired. So they were pretty, pretty uh, affected, long-term <coughs> affected, not only on the intestine, but also on other organs, the kidney and the liver. So there's room for improvement in these organs as well. Over a long time, we might also see some change benefits, not only on the PS reduction, but maybe also on our organ function. But we'll get back to that. So the results, are you ready for that? Mm. I think so. <laughs> okay, so here we have the results uh, for the primary endpoint. So on the x-axis, which is here, you see the time for baseline to week 24. On the y-axis, you see the change in parental support volume. And as you can see here, as David was mentioning, you see the placebo actually goes down. They reduce PS needs over time. Once weekly does have a little effect on top of placebo, but clearly twice weekly has a very strong effect uh, on, um, on, the, um, on the parental support. So, and as you can see also here, you can see actually the effect also already starts around week uh, eight to 12. That's where you see the effect kicks in. So twice weekly capacitide has a statistical significant effect on reduction in PS. It's around five liters as mean over uh, per week, over 24 weeks. It varies hugely among patients. Remember, these are mean data, right? So you will look at some patients, they have a relative reduction of 10% maybe, and some will have 50%. But in volume, this is what we're talking about. So what about the, uh, some of the other endpoints, the efficacy endpoints? This is the one with the 20% reduction in, in PS. And what you see here, again, the placebo, and then you see the once weekly and the twice weekly. And I think it's clear that the twice weekly is very efficacious. The statistics goes along with that. A and there might be something also with once weekly. But there's no statistical significance for the once weekly as there is for the twice weekly. What about uh, this one day or more off PS? That's also a clinical and I think patient very relevant endpoint, right? So here again, we see the placebo. They do have some effect. Once weekly has uh, additional effect and then twice weekly has 
this is statistically significant effect. Again, eight, 12 weeks, that's where it kicks in. That's where it opens up. So all the endpoints, the efficacy endpoints come out in favor of twice uh, weekly dosing, maybe also for once weekly on a group level. If you look at the individual data, that's another thing. But now we are only reporting on a group level. So this is the most interesting, and for me at least, and I think for most of the investigators, surprising finding. How many did actually achieve enteral autonomy, completely weaning off PS over 24 weeks? In previous studies, with GLP-2, that being stupefied after 24 weeks, the, the weaning off rate has been zero. In our trial, we are also able to show that placebo after 24 weeks has zero weaning off. With once weekly, four out of 35 weans off, and with twice weekly, five out of 35 weans off. I think these are really nice data. And as you can see, look at this, how, how early this happens. Some patients respond really fast and efficacious, right? Some of them, right? And then they just add, they come on as time goes by. So now we are 20, week 24, so where are we later in life? Time will show in our extension trials. But the statistics are very clear, both for once and for twice weekly, in favor uh, as compared to placebo for effect on that endpoint enteral autonomy, weaning off, and getting rid of the, the, uh, the IV catheter. Important. Safety, as I mentioned. Now we're, everybody's happy, but if the safety doesn't go, we're in trouble, right? So here we go with the safety data. The adverse events, this is how you report it. And I'll try to walk you through this very busy slide. I understand that. So overall, you can see the three arms, and as you can see in the, mo in the two active arms, the twice weekly and the once weekly with capaxotide compared to the placebo, there are 95, uh, 94%, 94%, and 72%. So there's more adverse events reported in the active arms. Not a big surprise. If you have something which is working, you will also have some side effects. If, it, if you don't have any side effects, you should be suspicious. So what is behind these adverse events? 95% of the reporting of adverse event effects is injection site reactions. That is the issue. They are reporting itching, redness, uh, maybe also a little bit pain, mild to moderate of severity, one to two days. But it's not a problem. None of the, the subjects wanted to withdraw from the trial or anything like that. But they are reporting it. So injection site reactions are, comes with injecting bepaclotide in some of the patients, actually the majority of patients will at some time point report, report some kind of reaction to the injection. But again, it is a mild to moderate of severity. Other uh, adverse events, we, talk, we, we put them into what we call serious and, and then the different severities. Serious uh, adverse events you also need to focus on because those are the ones which in principle could be life-threatening for a patient, they will, uh, they will uh, require medical attention immediately and usually also uh, admission to hospital for uh, observation and maybe therapy. And as you can see here, there are more serious adverse events in the active arm as compared to the placebo, 26%, 26%, and 19 These are small numbers. Okay, but there absolutely there's a signal that there's more serious adverse events in the active arm. They are due to the well-known mode of action and background disease of the patient, such as the nipple of the stoma enlarges, you have a little bit more abdominal pain, you have what is called sub -ileus. you know, where things tend to slow down, your abdomen blows up a little bit, you need to slow down a little bit uh, on eating and then it falls down after a few days. Stuff like that, all related to the mode of action of GLP-2. This is what GLP-2 does. Or to some of the background diseases which the patient has vascular disease or inflammatory bowel disease or whatever, which is behind. 
Okay? We did not uh, identify any unanticipated uh, adverse events which are, were of concern. And this is important. So overall, I think, uh, I think we can say that the, the efficacy data were positive and we did not pick up any signals or um, data which could indicate that it could be of any um, risk for the patient for safety assessment. So let's get to the, how, what is the patient uh, reporting? Um, and um, this is the SBA uh, results. So as you remember, we asked the, 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 the questions at baseline at, at week 24, you know, what, how do you feel and function? And we asked specific for specific symptoms. So this is called what is called the forest plot. So if the, 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 um, the um, round circle here, a circle is round, isn't it always? A circle <laughs> is here. Uh, so what we have here is in the middle, if the uh, circle is right in the middle of the dotted line, that's no different, right? So if it's on to the left, it's in favor of glipacrotide. If it's on the right, it's in favor of placebo, okay? So overall GI symptoms by, and then we try to look, you know, if it's due to um, a PS volume a classification of, of anatomy, uh, how many days, we try to look for different signals. And as you can see, it doesn't matter whether it's twice weekly or once weekly, it's all the same. And the bars indicate the variability in the group. You know, some are, uh, are patients report in one end and some report in the other. So overall for GI symptoms, if you ask them, you know, overall for your GI symptoms, have you, has, has there been any change from baseline to week 24? There's no, nothing really to, to, to look for. If we start going digging a little bit, now we look for abdominal pain. Here you see maybe something is happening here. Then you have, for instance here, you have something uh, uh, for both uh, once and twice weekly. Um, but again, it's not really, it's really not uh, substantial. And when the bars cross the dotted line, the t statistics are gone, if, you, if you're into statistics. And some are very much into statistics. So by what you see, I think in general, you'll see the circles are more or less, all of them are on the clipacrotide in favor. But we cannot conclude anything. It just indicates that it's probably doing something meaningful. Sleep, how about that? Okay, again, ooh, here we go. Here we got the st statistics going for sleep, okay? And again, you see the uh, circles, they are all pushing again towards the, uh, the clipacrotide favor. And now we have, uh, for some of the, uh, the endpoints, I, I think it's gonna be too much te technical to go into uh, all, all what's here, but sleep, absolutely, and that also makes sense, right? If you don't have, if you, if you go down in PS needs, you will sleep more, right? And it will affect your sleep pattern as well, but it should. Okay, so let's go to the final data set. And that is what we did was that we interviewed patients at 24 week when they exited the SBS1 trial. And they could, they could with their own words, uh, describe how they felt at baseline and what happened over time to the week 24. And what we did is that we just compiled some of the, 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 uh, the, the quotes from these interviews. And uh, as we're speaking, we are analyzing these data in a more structured way, and we'll be communicating in a more systematic way. As you can imagine, it's not so easy to communicate all these, uh, these 106 patients, how they are communicating things. We need to do this in a structured way, or it's gonna be all over the place. But I'll just let you, you read them as they come out. I think they are very descriptive for what is actually going on. Oops, that's interesting. It doesn't come out like, okay, interesting. Uh, the animation, that, uh, when I first made the animation, it actually popped up. Okay, so what I did was that I had the, the three here, the black ones coming on. I sleep much better on my nights off, so I feel better having an extra night, much less interrupted sleep. It's definitely an improvement on my mental health as well. I feel fear like I can go out and do things I don't have to worry about. Do I need fluids? I can't do that or, do, or, or those. It's kind of embarrassing to go out and have, you know, IV lines hanging out of you where, you where everyone can see them. It's freedom. Just again, it comes down to freedom. Freedom comes again and again. 
uh, and uh, being uh, able to do things, and now I keep going. I can do this. I can make it through a whole story trip and not having issues, and not get tired. These were just the three ones uh, we picked, uh, uh, which uh, we believe are pretty representative for how patients are, are communicating, how they feel at baseline, and what happens over time. So with this, I would like to conclude uh, and summarize what uh, we have, be I believe we have been demonstrating in this phase three trial, is that there was a significant reduction in PS requirements in patients with SBS <coughs> and intestinal failure. The overall reduction was around five liters, which equals 45% reduction from baseline. Again, mean, some high, some low. 66, that's two out of three patients achieved clinical response being the 20% reduction from baseline. 50%, 51% had a reduction uh, of one day or more on uh, twice weekly. Five out of the 35, which equals 40% of patients, they achieved enteral autonomy, weaned completely off following twice weekly, and uh, those having once weekly capacitized, they had 11% weaning off, four out of 35. In the SBSI uh, impact the tool, we observed an improved improvement in abdominal pain and sleep pattern, and it was well tolerated, assessed to be well tolerated, and had an acceptable safety profile over the 24 weeks of uh, therapy, and we conclude that clopaxotine is a novel long-acting GLP-2 analog that can reduce the burden of preferential support in patients with SBS and intestinal failure and represent an attractive, we believe, potential treatment option for the management of SBS. So with these words, I would like to thank my co-investigators, and I'm re representing uh, the trial as the sponsor. Here you go, US, Canada, and European side. Thank you for your attention. So thank you all. Um, if you want to, you know, you've, you've sat for an hour now, and I think that's plenty for everyone to sit at one time. Um, we can certainly do some questions right now if you'd like, but if you prefer what, do you want to take, should we take about 10 minutes and go stretch our legs and go to the bathroom and get a drink and stuff like that and then come back? And we, if you have questions about the trial, and, and you know, you could give some thoughts. In those 10 minutes, maybe you could think of like, um, what do you think about these endpoints? I mean, is this stuff that seems like it matters to you as patients? Do you, do you think, um, is a 20% reduction something that's relevant? Is a day off relevant? Or is coming, I mean, presumably coming off completely is relevant, but, but give some thought to that. And, and then I'll, I'm gonna stay basically, and we can talk about anything that you want to talk about. So we can talk about trial stuff, but if you don't wanna talk any more about the trial stuff, totally cool, now we can talk about anything. I don't care, it can be, whatever you want and we'll just, we'll just come up with it and maybe we can just have a really good discussion back and forth about what's been working for people or not working and I can answer questions or dispel misconceptions or give you my two cents on what I think about the world, you know, however we want to do it. That'll <laughs> be fine. So my watch says 352. Um, I would say how about come back, I, I know it's not very long, but maybe come back about four. Just take off, take a little, little break or whatever, go, run down and get a drink and then come on back at four, slightly after four. And don't feel bad if you come in, in dribs and shut up, sorry. And if you come back in little bits and fits and starts, that's fine. And we'll just, we'll just get started around four, a bit after four, and just come join us whenever you can. Okay. Bring others if you want to. Can I, oh, hold on a second. Uh, Camila, so uh, we have some snacks and drinks, right? Wh oh, can okay. Can you please inform so us about that? It's uh, just right out here, so I'll just walk uh, through. Just outside the door? Outside Beautiful, the door. thank you. <laughs> Go to the bar. <laughs> First, the first you do adults, and then you, 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 you make sure it that it's safe. They and make they make us do that. I'm pushing hard for the PD I stuff. Know, I yeah. Say, I'm like, no. I'm like, it doesn't quite apply to me yet. So. No.
05, and everyone will sort of start filtering back in. So I am happy to, I am happy to talk about anything that you guys would like to talk about, whether it's trial stuff or not. One of the things that we were just talking about, um, we were talking about the idea of the intestinal insufficiency patients. So saying, if I have short bowel, but I'm not on TPN, what does this mean for me? Like, is this something that's relevant to me at any time in the next 10 years or something? And, that, and, and I'll tell you that I don't know the actual answer to that, but what we were just saying is there's, there's kind of competing forces in, in trying to say we're going to look at intestinal insufficiency. We believe it's important, but payers are going to fight against those kinds of trials because they're going to say, well, we don't want to have to pay for this drug because you're already off of TPN. And so if you poop a little bit too much, too bad, you know, you'll be okay. You're not on TPN. Or, or if you have to eat a little bit more, then we, you know, we're not as worried about that. The flip side of that, though, is if you're the person who's making the medication, well, you, in a way, have a vested interest in trying to get to patients that have intestinal insufficiency because it's more patients. And so you can have the intestinal failure patients as well as the II patients. So I think that in a time frame that is sooner than you think, everyone will be looking at those kinds of trials. So we don't have like, I mean, Mark, we don't have like secret plans that we'll be doing that next month or anything. But, but the reality is... In what, in what context, though? Right. The, the thing is that these drugs might not necessarily make the same effect on patients that have all of their intestine. Because if you're already making all of your own GLP-2, adding more GLP-2 might not make a difference. So it might, but it might not. And so you're right. Those are, you could do those trials. Those trials would be big trials. That in, in numbers of trials, like they would just be like you'd have to do, you'd have to give the drug to probably, uh, uh, you know, a few thousand patients, and my guess would be the companies probably. Again, I don't know this. I'm not a company guy. They're just probably not. There's probably too much cash outlay to try to get that because the endpoints are really, really hard in critical, critical care trials. You know, it's really hard to show any difference. So that would that would be my suspicion is they just wouldn't want to do it. But Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So some of that data, we, that data is collected. We just don't have it yet. Like we don't, we don't have that released. And there's a variety of reasons, including like that we have to before we can really, really look at all of the detailed data from this ease one, we actually have to finish the the second trial ease two because the patients from the first trial rolled into the second one, and if we, s if we learn s certain information is blocked for just a little bit longer until ease 2 is done, and then we can actually find all that out. But we have all that stuff, and we'll see it. We'll see what the differences are on things like calcium and sodium and you know, okay. micronutrients and vitamins and all that kind of stuff. We believe it's going to have, I mean, we think that it's going to make a difference. And so you're right, then, then you could totally make the argument Again, these are things I, we fight for this all the time with payers is to say, well, we think that this patient would benefit even though they're not on TPN, and here's the reasons why. And so we just do it. Like, we'll, 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 we'll put the application in, and sometimes we get it, and, you know, sometimes we don't, but we're going to at least try to fight. Like, you know, what all it costs us is, you know, doing the paperwork and a bunch of phone calls and stuff, but in the grand scheme of things, if we get it approved, it's totally worth it, so. Well, and there's so many long-term effects, too, that kind of take you away from mm -hmm. your Yeah. And how old is she right now? So because it made me think of something. So for those of you that have like little ones who are on who are on TPN and have short bowel right now. So one of the things that's interesting about thinking about things in the context of GLP-2 analogs and even the stuff like we're getting better and better at maintaining lines and there's going to be we could talk about cool stuff that's going to come for lines that's going to really change everything again is that so when kids are kids, they need a lot of calories, right? And, and so, like, if you think, like, a baby might need 90 calories per kilogram per day, and then a 6-year-old or an 8-year-old probably needs 65 or 70 cows per kilo per day. Once you're done growing, 
Like I probably need 26 cows per kilo per day or something like that. So if you go back to 20 years ago, we as a people couldn't necessarily keep kids alive to become adults and stop growing. But now we can. So now we have a whole field of kids who are in high school and going off to college and stuff. And what we're discovering is as they get through puberty and they hit that top of their growth curve where they flatten out, their short bowel syndrome gets easier to manage because they don't need so much calories. All they have to do is maintain. And so it raises this fascinating question of, do you actually grow out of short bowel syndrome? Right, you always have short bowel, but you kind of grow out of the syndrome part of it when you get older. And that's what we're seeing, actually. What we're seeing is as kids get to the end of their teen years and they finish up high school and they're going off to college and they're done growing, it's, uh, it's easier. They don't have to build bone. They don't have to build muscle. And so if they had to be jamming calories in all through puberty and stuff like that, they don't have to so much once they get to their final weight. What we've even seen, honestly, is we've seen kids who, like if you want to talk about like Gatex and stuff, kids who, uh, who go on to the drug, gets them off of TPN, and then when they're done growing, we can actually wean them off the drug. Right now, the, the way these drugs work, it, you know, if, if you stop taking the drug, you go back to how you were. You don't get, it doesn't cause a permanent change, it causes a temporary change, it's transient. But the beauty for kids is kids are changing all the time in the background of what we're doing. So, so it's completely changed. This, this concept of growing out of your short bowel syndrome changes totally the way I think about everything. Changes about how I think about surgeries, the kinds of surgeries I would choose to do. Because sometimes you can sit back and take the long view and you can say like, like I mean, you're off TPN right now, right? But if you were 10 years old and on TPN, well, now I could sit down and I could say, well, you know what? She's probably going to stop growing when she's about 16. So you're already 65% of the way to where you need to be. And so maybe we just kind of keep things cool and we stay good and we see how we do when we're done growing, knowing that things might get better. And there's stuff coming. So like one of the things that's going to come in the next few years, we're going to start a pediatric trial really soon on a different kind of lock that we don't have in the U.S. right now. But you guys might have heard of kite locks. You know, you, you started, it started, people are starting to hear about kite locks. So remember how we had ethanol locks? And some of you, ma many of you might have been on ethanol locks. And then the government changed the designation of ethanol. So they made a little document out that they said ethanol is now a, is, is like a, a drug. And so, so basically overnight, ethanol locks went from being $40 a day to being $900 a day. Because three, there was three companies making them. Two of them said, well, we're not going to do it. And the other one said, perfect. We're the only ones that make ethanol locks now. They're $1,000 a day. So we all lost them, for the most part. You can still get them sometimes. But, the, but, but this new thing that's going to come out, um, and we're going to start the trials in, is, is something called EDTA. So EDTA is a chelator. It chelates, binds up calcium. And so calcium is important for all living things, have to have some calcium in their environment. The, the stuff that they form on lines called biofilms are dependent on calcium. Plus, we need calcium to clot. So if you put this little bit of EDTA inside the lines, it binds up all the calcium right away. So nothing can live, but nothing can clot. And so there's a really cool little study that came out of Toronto from sick kids where they looked at 20 kids that got EDTA locks and their line infection rate went to zero and their line occlusion rate went to zero. And so I wrote a little editorial last year about it that said this is a small little study that has a huge impact because it might be that if these things pan out, maybe we won't necessarily have, I mean, I, I don't want to say we're never going to have line infections because that would be, you know, overly cocky to say, but we may have way less line infections and we may have way less clots and we may have less breaks and stuff. So we're going to start that trial probably sometime in, um, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to start amongst sort of the eight big pediatric centers in the country and we'll do a PD trial first and that will probably start in maybe the fall might be, may, might not, well, it probably won't be the fall. Probably be more like the beginning of next year by the time everybody gets organized. It just depends a little bit on how quickly the FDA gets some stuff to us. But, so that's a cool thing. And that's going to affect everybody, kids and adults. Like that's, n even though we do a PD trial, when it gets approved, it'll be for everyone. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's just, yeah, it's a, it's, it's an, it's, I think it was easier for us to get a whole bunch of people on board very quickly to do. PEDS is funny because PEDS I is a more united thing in the country. We can sort of do things faster. Those of you that are adults realize like adults is really hard in the United States because there's not like a bunch of really good centers and there's not a lot of uniformity. But PEDS, we sort of have this community where we can do things faster. So we thought it would be faster to just tackle it that way 
and get it done instead of like limping along doing an adult trial forever. And if it was okay for fees, would that automatically? Yeah, yeah it, it, in general it would. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So usually then we could, if we got a PD approval, we could use it off label right away. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We would hope to be able to do that. No, you have to. You had to have a glomerular filtration rate above thirty. Exactly. Yeah. So it's it's that it's not wh whether you have stones or not. Okay. It's simply the function. It's the function on the usual kidney function yeah. parameters. So for most people, that's going to be like as long as your baseline creatinine is probably below like one point, or probably below two, yeah. so like in that ballpark. You know, and depending on how skinny you are, but. Um, you know, that, that, that's about where it's going to be. And what, is, what, is, what is really nice about uh, the, this uh, cebaxacide uh, uh, is that it, it, it is actually, you don't have to change dosing. The exposure of cebaxacide is independent on kidney function. So you don't have to go up or down in dosing. If you have renal impairment, kidney function goes down, then you need to reduce the dose. You don't have to do that. So that's also an important uh, part. That, that is demonstrated in a separate trial, which is already published. <coughs> yeah? Um, so this is maybe a very specific question, but um, so for the, one of the criteria, one of the exclusion criteria for this was sensitivity to the pack was high. Yeah, to the fluorescence in the white. Right yeah, of course. Specific. So, in, so is that just for the trial, or if my daughter in high gas tanks and had to That, that's a, it's really a trial thing as and opposed to an actual trial, use thing. Trials are, trials are like magical little artificial worlds right. partly and we can't, and you can't really, you know, you have to be super careful about certain right. things. Yeah, so that, in the end that like, th there, there won't be anything on the label that says you can't so do it. Yeah. So what you do in these trials is that you actually, you're very uh, observant around the, the uh, antibody production. How <coughs> does the body respond to the pacrocyte a new drug, you know, does it, uh, does it uh, produce antibodies towards the, uh, not only the drug, the new drug, but w whether these antibodies also neutralize the drug effect and actually cross reacts to some of the natural GLP-2 as well. So this, uh, these data will also be uh, disclosed at some point when we have all the data collected and, uh, and done the analysis also long term. But so far we have not observed anything of concern with uh, immunogenicity, that's what we call it, the body's reaction to uh, cleptacrocyte. And we haven't seen that in GATEX and you know, we haven't seen problems of neutralizing antibodies in 10 years too, so we think that's probably okay. I, I know that those studies are still in territorial, but I was curious <laughs> What, what do you mean in terms of? Like, what are the impacts here? When you look at the, the outcome data from this trial, can, and, and so it isn't, it, you know, it, it, it isn't fair to, to compare, and, and, and partly because there's more different eras, right? So there are differences, you know, to 12 years has passed or 10 years has passed or whatever. But it, 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 the data looks like maybe the absolute magnitude of the new drug is a little bit higher, so it might be a little greater drop. And then the one difference, uh, we'll have to see as we see the longer term data, it was that having the patients come off completely versus in the original trials, there weren't patients that came off completely. Yeah. So those are, those are key differences between them, but we don't really know, you know, in fairness, like it, sure. yeah, yeah, you know, like if, you, if scientifically, if you said, oh, can we compare the two trials, you'd get slaughtered. Like you could never, <laughs> you, you could never submit that manuscript because they would kill you, they, so you would never, <laughs> so it would just wouldn't be worth putting your time in to do it, but, but anecdotally. That's an, that's an even tougher question to answer because we did that, that one we really, really, really just don't know at all. Like, because the thing is like, I don't even know in the patients that we have on trial, like I don't know if they're on drug or if they're on placebo or anything. So I couldn't, I couldn't even from my own experience, I couldn't say, oh, well, I have two patients and they're both doing awesome because maybe they're on placebo. So, so that one's super, super early. They may have some, they, they may put out a little bit of data um, 
uh, maybe even this upcoming weekend. I think they might have a little bit of stuff that will come out in CERTA, but I don't, but I, don't, but I just, nobody knows yet. I mean, somebody does know, and we'll find out in five days. I don't, <laughs> so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can I just add a little <laughs> Oh, yeah, sure. Can I just add a little bit? And then bit we'll talk about I think, bees. Um, this is a, I completely agree with you what you're pointing to. And I think I also try to emphasize this also in the presentation is that you need to be very careful when you start comparing things, right? I, I know I, I mentioned the inclusion, exclusion. I said very simple to go see Matt, the length, what is the age of the patient, the, the disease, the duration. There's a lot of variables. And if you, if they're not uh, similar and you know that one or a two factors are in favor or disfavor of changes over time, then you are falsely uh, informed by trying to compare. Yeah. So it's really, really, that's so, so that is where you need the experts to help interpret and identify where the differences in design and endpoints and output are. Is the trial three weeks versus two weeks or four weeks in phase two trials? That's a major difference, for instance. Things like that, they're all over the place, so be careful when you compare. But I think the, f the question is fair enough, uh, you know, uh, asking this, and it needs to be uh, uh, put this question at the end of the day. Are they in the same ballpark, or are there significant differences with respect to efficacy, safety, and the overall clinical benefit ratio? But the PD stuff, obviously, you know, I mean, that's near and dear to my heart, too, because I do both. So we're, I'm, I'm pushing super, super hard to get the PD trials started. It just takes time because you have to, the FDA kind of has to approve it for adults first before they'll let you start to experiment on kids. So that's what the pain in the ass is. Even though we're like, I think it works really good, and we've been using this over drug forever, and we just really want to do it, and, you know, he knows because I've been, we, we've started talking about pediatric trials I mean, gosh, probably oh for man. maybe two years. Yeah. We started talking about them two years ago, and we meet about every three months to just talk about how we would design them and what could, because we'll hit the ground running the second the FDA says we can, because we will obviously these will be big, you know, big important things. Because one area where this is really a difference is in a kid, right? Seven shots a week versus one shot or two shots a week is a major thing. Adults, you could say, oh, well, you know, maybe adults can suck it up and do their seven shots. But nobody really likes seven shots compared to less. So, so but, but in peds, you really do see a difference. So I think that's why that's a, you know, that, that is an important thing to do. It just takes some time just to, to, you know, we gotta jump through the hoops to get to that. Yeah, no, go ahead. Mm -hmm. it's an interesting point I was thinking. Um, I remember when we were first sort of discussing the, the potential for transplant, and I think some of the guidance we got was not that it was like a now or never, but it was a little bit like, oh, well, it's something that you want to do while you're still growing because your body is going to be able to heal and yeah. adapt. versus there are things we want to do sooner so the body has the maximum ability to yeah. um, so you you're right. I mean that's the that's the crux of things. It does because it changes those. And for me personally, as someone who also does transplants, it really changes it. It makes me really, really think it over a lot harder. And I've always been somebody who thinks really hard about that. Like most of the patients that come to us we don't recommend transplant for. We virtually always choose rehabilitation, and, 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 but it's not always right. It depends it, on what set of risks you show up with when you walk through the door. So if you show up and you have all of your blood vessels, or you, let's say five or six blood vessels are gone, and you're still on a ton of TPN and you're having complications, well then, there's a risk to not doing something, right? There's a risk to saying, oh, well, Dave thinks he can get you off TPN. Let's try for three years. But then what if something bad happens and you don't, and you die as a consequence of that decision? So we have to think about that. But these other ideas about growing out of it are really important. You know, like if you look at adult short bowel data now, so almost every patient with 70, adult patient with 70 centimeters of small bowel and let's say two thirds of their colon ish, like mid transverse colon down, almost every patient with that anatomy will come off of TPN. And 
And we have patients now who have, say, like 50 centimeters of jejunum to an ostomy who are off of TPN. Maybe still on a little bit of IV fluids or something, but even people that are really, really short are starting, in, in the era of GLP-2s, are starting to come off of support. And so remember I told you about that, how your bowel doubles in the third trimester and then it doubles by the time you're two years old then it doubles again by the time you're 12. So you can start to look at that and you can say, you know, and I do this all the time and parents can do it too. You can look and you can say, well, you know, I have my two-year-old and these guys said that we have 40 centimeters of small bowel. And yeah, we're on TPN three days a week and we're on two feeds of 60 mils an hour overnight and bolus feeds during the day. But, but you know, if I think that what he's saying is true and that's going to double and I've got 40 centimeters now at two years old, then that means I'm probably going to have 70 or 80 centimeters when I'm 12 years old. And Mercer said, if you get to that point and you're done growing and you're an adult, you're probably going to come off of TPN. So then you can sort of make that calculation. You can take that long view and you can go, well, you know, if we can just stay good, I might be okay. Another way that you can kind of back calculate that is you can say how much, if my kid is tracking on a growth curve, how many parenteral calories are they getting? Because if I give you a, a, a gut calorie, an enteral calorie, I don't really know how much of that you're getting, right? And so, and this happens a lots of times when we see people coming from non-expert centers and kids will show up and they're on an ungodly amount of tube feeds, pooping their brains out because the, the default response in people's heads is, oh, if you're not growing, let's just give you more tube feeds, right? But if you can only absorb X amount of tube feeds, giving you 3X tube feeds doesn't make you absorb 3X calories. It just makes you poo 3X times but you don't absorb more than whatever you can absorb. And so, but what you can't fake is parenteral calories. So every calorie you get intravenously, you get for sure. So if you have a kid who's growing and you ask your dietitian or you ask your team, you say, how many parenteral calories am I getting per kilo? And if they say, well, you're getting, we have to give your daughter 35 cows per kilo to grow, okay? And she's two years old. So you say she needs 35 cows per kilo to grow and she's two. So her baseline calorie requirements are probably 75 or 80 cows per kilo. She's only getting 35 by TPN, which means she must be capable of absorbing 45. Now an adult who's done growing only has to absorb about 27 or 28. So right now your two-year-old is really kind of telling you, I, if I'm going to be okay when I'm 18. I'm going to be all right, right? Because I'm already absorbing that much right now when I'm two. So as long as something catastrophic doesn't happen to what I have, and if you can keep me healthy, I'm probably going to be all right when I grow up. And so then that changes how, like, we as a program view things. Because, because it, I think it might be nice as a parent, I guess. I mean, if I was sitting on the other side of the conversation and I was thinking about it, I might go, oh, well, that's good to know. Because when I achieve those goals, you know, if I can just stay healthy, and that's a big if, but if I can stay healthy, then maybe we can do really good. Mm-hmm. Right. So when I was a fellow, that was, we, we pulled lines out left, right, and center. You know, that was just, what I spent half my life pulling out lines and putting lines back in again. And we just don't, I mean, we, now you know we don't do that, right? We don't take lines out because we can treat through almost everything. But I think the new locks, I think the EDTA locks are going to change that. That's what that, that Toronto data, I mean, it literally was like, they, they went to zero. Now, the people will always get line infections, but... But I think that I think the line infection rates are going to go down as we get the better locks. And just adding to that, do you? S yeah, do you still? I know. Well, we, you know. Oh, is that right? Because, because you know, like for you, like we we have them call us, right? We always say, if you're in the emergency department, call us and have someone in the emergency department talk to us, because um, because. You know, then I'll say, no, 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 don't. Don't, don't take that line out. You don't need to, y you know. Yeah, yeah, or it's just, yeah, it's just a bigger pain in the ass. You got to have another procedure and everything else. I mean, you can treat through 90% plus. There's certain bacteria that we, you know, bad fun, bad, um, you know, bad candida infections. Yeah. There's certain ones that you probably can't screw around with. But generally, you're almost always okay. And I must say, you know, some of this will be heresy to everyone in the room, but I, you know, I've gotten a lot more chill about lines over the years. Mm -hmm. Like, I really, like, I'm, I'm a big believer, like, kids got to be kids, so, like, I'm okay with swimming with lines and stuff like that, right? And everyone's like, oh, my God, what? You know? I'm like, once you've had a line and it's engrafted in there for a couple of months and that Dacron cuff is in, 
I've never really had anybody have a problem swimming, and I've been letting kids swim for years. I would just tell, tell them, like, don't swim in the ditch, you know, like, don't swim in the, <laughs> don't go in the, don't be in the swamp. Yeah, but, right. but if you're in a swimming pool or even a clean lake, it's probably fine. It makes your dressing lift off. But if you put glad press and seal over top of it and then wear a little sun suit, you know, those little, those little suits over top, most of the dressings stick on pretty good under press and seal plus a, plus a little sun suit. And kids are usually pretty good. Adults, too. Yeah. Just who remembers? Like, yeah. How is that? Is that something that can be sort of done like sticking out of your foot, or is it really like when you're cut open and you measure it? And then so, so never know the best way to do it is when you're open. Okay. It really is, right? That's honestly the best way. The way we truly do it is when I have all your intestine all entangled and everything. I take a silk tie and I literally lay the silk tie along the bowel, following all the curves and everything. Then I measure how long that tie is, and that's how I know what the measurement is, and that's the most accurate thing. But you can kind of get a rough ballpark. Like it would just be for your own interest sake, but you, if you've got a small bowel series done or, or if you've had a CAT scan, if you've had a CT, any CT done in the last 10 years ever, you could probably kind of, like a, anyone, anyone who treats you, I mean, uh, you, you come see us out. I can, I can figure it out on a CAT scan and give you a ballpark sense. You know, you can, yeah, you can, you can. Yeah, you can, you can so sort of get a sense. If you want to measure it and you, you, the best, way to do that is using an MR scan and the latest version is three dimensional. Those are the ones which most accurately will measure the, the, the length. But it is not as good as doing it, you know, when in real life. Yeah. 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 And maybe cutting up that is a li taking a little bit too far. Yeah, cutting you open just to know that would be a bit much. But <laughs> what else does anyone want to talk about? So that, that's a very good question, right? Because if you're giving somebody something that's driving their cells to proliferate, what, who's to say that they won't make a mistake proliferating and turn into a cancer over time or something? So, so in adults, we tend to do colonoscopies on the patients, usually every one to two years while they're on therapy. We don't do that in the children so much. We tend to screen the kids mostly by doing like, a, like just a fecal occult blood and watching to see. Um, although we're going to have to think about that a little bit. I have a feeling we're going to have to fall somewhere in between on the kids and we'll probably have to look at least for a while. Now, in, um, Ga you know, Gatex has now been approved since 2012. And if you go back to the beginning of the trials, you're really talking about a drug that we've had for 15 years or so. And we haven't seen an increase in that signal above the general population. So I guess we would, you would hope that maybe after 10 years or 12 years or something of continuous use mm -hmm. that if it was really causing a bunch of polyps and a bunch of cancers and stuff that that signal would have emerged already and we've all watched pretty closely for it. So that's not hard science, but it's kind of like, it's just arguing by experience. We've done it long enough and we haven't seen it, so it's, it's hopefully okay, but we'll keep watching. And that's the best we can do is just be vigilant, I guess, and see. But I also think, like on the PD side, that's why I think the, the, the chance that maybe you can come off of the drug someday is, you know, anything you can do that reduces your exposure, I think, is probably desirable. I must say, we do that with Gatex. You know, if we have a patient who's stable and on Gatex for some period of time, I uh, usually will go six months or a year or something, and then, and then we'll try to reduce their dose just in the interest of being good stewards of the using the least amount that gives us the same efficacy. It's kind of like how you wean TPN, you know, we just sort of wean the Gatex the same way. We would probably do that 10 minutes, thank you. Ultimately, we, you know, when we get, say, GLEPA available, I mean, we're gonna have to figure out a little bit how to use it, because the way you use it in a trial is different from how we might use it in real life, too. Because you saw, some of the once-weekly patients do great, 
Some of the patients seem to require it twice weekly. And I, and I will say, we're starting to, we still don't have the code cracked on our own patients, but we can kind of guess because we've been doing it for four and a half years on some of them. And I do think there's going to be patients who will be okay on once a week, and there will be some that need twice a week, and we'll have to figure out who's who. And so then becomes interesting, like, to say, well, do you start off big? Do you treat everybody twice a week? And then get everyone as good as they can be, and then maybe half of them can go once a week? Or do you start the other way, you know, start everybody once a week and see who does really good, and then add a second dose into the ones who need more of a boost? I don't quite know how I feel about that yet. I have to wait until it comes. I'm probably going to be somebody who's more like goes for the gusto at the beginning to try to get the best possible efficacy I can early on and then back off. I just that's probably how I am as a person. So that's more philosophy than science, but, uh, but I'm probably going to go for it and then back down. David, uh, there's one question oh, here uh, yes. around because I understand that it, it is, it varies. Uh, US is one thing, Europe is something else. How is reimbursed? Because that is a major problem for a lot of new patients, right? If it's a, because if you fall below a certain PS requirement or whatever, then you also fall out of being reimbursed for certain medicines. Is that correct? I, that's what I understand. It can be in some cases, yeah. yeah. So I if you fool around, so to speak, in areas where you don't have the full effect, you are at risk of losing the reimbursement opportunity, right? Uh, so will that, does that impact your way of thinking, when, you know, when you're dosing and recommending? Uh, is that reimbursement or do you, do you go for what is uh, medically is, is like the only thing to, to uh, bring into consideration here? Yeah. It, so I, I'm, I'm, it's a hard, it's a hard question, yeah, it's right? it's a difficult one. It's a hard question. We, uh, we, I, I don't, I don't as a physician ever sort of think, I mean, first of all, you know, we don't get reimbursed for anything, right? Like that, so whether or not I prescribe, I don't get a kickback or anything like that. It doesn't matter to us. But I don't really ever think about it. Mm. I think we're pretty, you know, b this is partly a Nebraska thing. I mean, we, we, this is what we live all the time. And so we pretty aggressively go after trying to get it when we think that it's the right thing to do. And I don't think we really think all that much about the reimbursement no. one way or the other. Kay. We've not, and, and so far, kudos to Takeda. Um, you know, we don't um, really have patients who have been denied. I think yeah. usually sure. we've been able to find a way to, yeah. and that'll be obviously us a relevant point to the future of the new drugs too, you know. Yeah, it's crazy if you lose reimbursement uh, when it works, right? Yeah, yeah. you know, the, the, uh, at first, at first, we actually got a little bit of that, but yeah. then I think even the payers realized that was stupid. Okay. And 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 so we, so they, you know, because we did get that for a little bit at first, like, well, you you don't need it anymore, and then and we'd be like, well, the only reason we're off TPN is because of the drug. It, like, it doesn't make sense to stop the drug, go back on TPN, go back on the drug, and do that every six months, and then so they did realize that. Did you have a question? I was thinking about the placebo effect you're talking about. Do you think it's because you have such a low dose of the medicine that you don't want to take it and then you take it and then you get a placebo effect? I do. Th I think you're right about that. I think that's part of it. I think it's, you know, the way these trials work, we didn't go into the, w but the way this actually worked was people had to drink a set drinking menu. So on, they would do a 48 hour urine collection. And during that 48 hours, they had to drink a set menu that they had agreed upon before the trial started. And that's kind of how all the trials work, um, generally how they work. And, and so there's a lot of factors that go into it, but that's one of them, I think. One of it is there's a focus on, on being sure, like in that 48 hours, you drank your three liters of fluid, which we all know doesn't always happen day to day. We're not always drinking the way we're supposed to. So. Do you think you should all just stop with the placebo effect? So when I get to see, when I get to see my own. trial and you, you will improve. When I, it's true. <laughs> doesn't matter it, what it is. It could just be any trial, right? You know, antihypertensive. <laughs> When I get to see my own, our own center's data, that I'm, I've already told the whole team, I'm like, we're gonna s take a look and see what our placebo effect is because if we have one, then, uh, you know, in a way I'm okay with that. I'll be a little bit like kind of pissed off at myself because I'm all cocky and think I shouldn't have any. But if I have one, then I'm gonna be like, oh good, well there's an opportunity that I can do even better because clearly there's something that we're not. Mm -hmm. and and, and we've, one of the things that we've learned just from doing the trials is we're much more focused on doing urine collections than we used to be. 
and and on using that to guide it. So we, we do, even our non-trial patients, we do a lot more measuring now and almost, I, we're never really algorithmic in how we reduce things, but I think we think about it maybe a little bit more that way. That to get rid of that placebo effect, what we'd really probably have to do is do like about a 12 month lead in, right? But then no company wants to pay for like a, you know, a 12 month lead into a trial, it's just too expensive. I think we could get rid of the placebo effect, but I just think it would take it would take a long time. You'd have to really make patients stable, really optimize them and keep them optimized. And in the interest of trying to do trials in a timely fashion, you know, you're optimizing someone in six weeks. You're getting, trying to get optimization and stabilization in eight weeks. And so, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of hard to really, really be stable in eight weeks. And one of the X factors in the trials is you, you control what people drink, but you don't control what they eat. And so during that 48 hour collection is soup a drink? Technically not in your drinking menu, right? <laughs> so it's not in your drinking menu. So, but if you drank a liter of, of cream of tomato soup, well, that's another liter of liquid, but we don't record that. And so there's, there's, so there's subtleties to it that, you know, that are in the trials that we just, you can only design so many things. People have to live their lives, right? These are hard enough trials on patients without like prescribing what they eat every day too and stuff, so. Yeah. Oh, five minutes, oh, oh, give me the five minute question. Do you have a question? People were allowed to just treat it however they wanted to treat it. So there was, no, there was no rule in the trial that said it had to be treated with a certain antibiotic. So all the clinical care in the trial outside of decisions on reducing TPN were just standard of care for your own center. So, so people could treat probiotics, antibiotics, whatever the heck they wanted. Mm -hmm. We don't know for sure about, I, 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 I maybe overspoke a little bit about that, but one possibility could be if you increase the blood flow, um, could it lead to a little bit of dizziness where, uh, where you could just be kind of losing a little bit of blood from your GI tract? Because, you know, uh, it's not that uncommon. You, you might have old staple lines, old anastomoses, old stuff on the inside and maybe if you start to blast more blood flow past that theoretically you know could you start to get a little more oozingness as a consequence of that so that's really more more what i was getting at is in theory could that be an could that be a downside i'm not sure that we've seen it be a downside yet but i must say in one kid i did wonder i really did wonder because it was like there was a there was a source of blood loss and i'm like i cannot find it and i've, I've gone so far as to go to the operating room and actually do a full laparotomy, untangle all the bowel, and scope the entire small intestine to try to find a source of bleeding, and didn't find one. And then I was left with saying, "Well, is there a possibility? Like, could it be this? You know?" But, but it's kind of hard to stop Gatex when it's having a really good effect on you. So. Absolutely, and it, it's super, super dependent on each person because obviously we, um, if, if you have someone who really, really can't take in anything by mouth, you know, then you can talk about, well, what can we put in a J-tube and can we do some J-fluids or something, anything, because it's, it's a little hard if someone can't take in anything at all to, to say, can you go days and days and days without getting anything parenteral. But even then, you sometimes can. You know, sometimes you can sneak a day because if you don't have a lot of loss, you know, if then and if you know, then or, or or you can come off of parenteral calories, but just be on fluid, which can then be whipped in a lot faster. You know, you can give someone two liters of normal saline in three hours or four hours or something. So that's not so bad because you can get the kids off to you know get home from soccer, get people in bed at eight o'clock hook up your IV fluids, be done by 10, 30, or 11, and then sleep without your line hooked up, which is, you know, and you don't have to pee all night and you can have a better sleep and stuff like that, so. From the GLP-2s? Mm. Not really. 
Yeah. So in my own in my own experience, we, I've never really had anybody have much problem with it. People seem to actually tolerate it really pretty well. Like we didn't have any real trouble. So oh, we're out. Okay, we're, we're apparently we're out in a couple minutes. I'm happy to stay and talk more, but you guys are all you're all free. You're all excused if you want to go. <laughs> but um, so I don't know. I, th there there are there probably are patients. I think if you looked in the grand scheme of every patient who's ever been on it, there will be people who would say I just couldn't tolerate it very well. Um, one of the things people will notice sometimes when they go on is their insides change, right? Because your lining of your intestine is growing, and people, it's like they become aware of their intestines for a while, and it feels weird. Like they have this perception of stuff moving through them. But then the body kind of, like any autonomic thing, it tends to fade into the background after a couple of months. You're welcome. So mostly I think if people know that it's coming, then they're not freaked out by it. And then they just, they're kind of like, oh, that feels weird. But then you say, well, the weirdness is probably going to pass. And it generally does pass. But there are people who've had to stop just because they, they you know, just couldn't tolerate the way it felt. Yeah. All right. You're all free, but I'm happy to see and talk to whomever wants to, if you like. You know, it's no problem. Thank you all for your attention. Thanks for coming Thank and for you. the good questions.